Hello and welcome to another edition of The Point of View. Today we have a very special program for you. It's a program that's, uh, of course, coming with all the monotony of the football to give you something else to think about. And in a couple of days' time, our guest is going to launch a very interesting book that we'll be talking about. But this program is also interspersed between that book launch and an equally important event that happened a few days ago to celebrate the legacy of a great African. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you for staying with us. When we come back, I'll tell you who my guest is and why you should be excited about today's program. Welcome back. So today we are talking to Mrs. Matilda and Mr. Arthur, who is a um, former second lady for the Republic of Ghana. She's an author, she's an educationist, a librarian, and she's also a philanthropist. Today we are trying to get into the mind of this woman who's been through a lot in the past 24 months. She's launching a book on Wednesday on strength in the storm to reveal a part of her a lot of us did not know. We'll talk about some of the highlights of the over 40 years of public service that she and her husband were involved in. Working in Ghana, a place which is very interesting politically, and her views about the way to make this country work again and to get things to be done better. Madam, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you so much. On Friday, I was at... Um, the University of Ghana with you, and we had a very big program with Professor Charles Soludo. What were your impressions about that program, and why did you put it together in the first place? To commemorate the one-year anniversary of the death of my husband, the family decided that we would do a number of things that would bring out his legacy and also just help in letting those who do not really know him, know him. And the Friday lecture was one of the things we put together. We started on Monday 24th, where we commissioned a library in Ohau, in the Volta region, and an ICT and library named after him. So it's called the Misata Learning Center. And then on Wednesday 26th, we were in Mori Senior Secondary School to donate woodwork equipment to the school and also to donate hospital items to the hospital. And then on Friday, we had the economic forum. In your view, how well was Friday, did Friday turn out? Are you happy that the way the lecture went and all the people turned up? Is that what you imagined? Are you satisfied? We actually knew that it was going to be a very good lecture. We knew that attendance was going to be good. We knew Sol Soludo was going to speak well. Because if you look at Soludo's uh, bio, bio, and if you go on the net, you will see that Soludo is interested in almost the same things that my husband was interested in. And they have the same field of economics, they done similar things. And so we knew that Soludo would give a good lecture. Mm. We also knew that people would um, readily understand him because Soludo is a down-to-earth person and we would heard some of his speeches. So we knew that it would be good. It would be good. Even though he actually exceeded our expectation mm. and the comments coming from people were just more than we expected. But he did a good job. So, he did a good job. so are you surprised when there were people sharing on social media certain aspects of the video saying certain things about why he came and all that? I mean, <laughs> how did you receive that? Yeah, you see, when something happens, everybody has their opinion on it. And so that does not worry me. Because the majority of people commented, have commented, have actually said things that are true. And for anybody who came to the lecture, there were nuggets that everybody could take away. There was something for Ghana, something for Nigeria. In my view, he even bashed Nigeria more than Ghana. Yeah. And in Ghana, he stayed overboard. He was a true and true academic as we wanted the lecture to be. But at the same time, the ordinary man also could enjoy what he said. And for us, that was exactly what he wanted because that's just what my husband always wanted and always aspired. Do you think Ghanaians understand or appreciate the type of man your husband was? I'm asking this because we know that he was Deputy Finance Minister many years I mean, this was when I was in UPS, in the 80s. Then he became substantive finance or minister. Then he became a governor. 
before vice president. He, he, he doesn't talk that much. He's not always on the front pages. So even though he's been in public service for many, many years, he's not somebody who's seen talking that much. Do, do you feel we knew who exactly this person was or we're just seeing a small part of him? I think that there's a section of Ghanaians who knew exactly who he was. And there's also a section who didn't know. The thing is that my husband was a very private person and was a technocrat true and true. And as I said at the funeral and I keep telling people, my husband was not the mainstream politician, if you like it. He was a technocrat. Yes, he belonged to NDC. He was vice president for NDC. But he was first and foremost a technocrat who did his work and did it well. Unfortunately, the position of vice president, whether in Ghana, in America, or in Europe, is one that doesn't come to the forefront. The vice president is actually, as the Americans say, president in waiting. When the president is not there or not available, you do the work. Until you've been given something to do, you stay in the shadows. And that is the work of the vice president. And if you look elsewhere, America, Europe, vice presidents do not make headlines. Vice presidents are not seen or heard. And so it's the same in Ghana. But the typical Ghanaian wants somebody who goes to the media, who shouts and is everywhere. So because my husband is quiet, will not go to the media, will not shout for Ghanaians, he wasn't the kind of person that they wanted. But the people who knew my husband knew his worth and knew who he was. So when the idea came that he would be the running mate and later vice president, how did you take that? Because I know that you've already been in public service, finance ministry, BOG, so we already know that you are going to serve the country. But how did the family, you and the kids, process the idea that he was to be on a ticket to be running mate in an election? That's a different level of public service, is it not? And how did that campaigning and all of that affect you? Honestly, he himself did not want to take the job as the running mate of the president. And three times he refused the offer. It was on the fourth occasion that he agreed. And he agreed after we had gone into much prayer and were convinced that that was what the Lord wanted him to do. And that is how he agreed. So, I mean, how did the family process the idea of vice president running mate because yes he's been deputy financed he's been financed BOG governor this is all public service but to be the running mate in an election how, how did you take that he himself did not want that position and three times he refused it when the president asked him wow. it was only after we had prayed about it and been convinced that that was what the Lord wanted him to do that he accepted wow. as a family we also did not want him to take it. First of all, you are thrown into the public light. Yes, he's been finance minister. He's been governor of the Bank of Ghana. Mm. But these two positions are not quite the same as the vice president. And we are a very private family. And therefore, we didn't want to come into the limelight. And knowing especially the kind of politics we do in Ghana as a family, we didn't want it. But when we're convinced that that was what God wanted him to do, we had to accept it. Oh, so it was the fourth time? It was the fourth time. So it means they sent delegations? Yes. His friends to come. But based on his relationship with former President Mills and being one of the most prominent people from that part of the country in the party, it shouldn't have been a surprise for you? It wasn't a surprise, but it was something that we did not want. He didn't want, we didn't want, but it wasn't a surprise. Yeah. Really? But how different would that be from being, say, a governor or a finance minister in the Rawlings administration in the 90s because that time was a very interesting time as well so are you saying that just because of the fact that he would go on the ballot sheet or he would he would be campaigning directly is not your typical public service but on the politics is more no as the deputy finance minister even though he spearheaded a lot of things that happened at that time in terms of with IMF and World Bank and things he wasn't as you take it the forefront the minister was there and he was a technocrat so he wasn't always there and besides don't you forget it was a military regime most of the time yes. and therefore 
um, Rawlings did most of the talking, even when it came from the finance. And as deputy minister in the Republic also, he wasn't thrown in the front. And at that time, politics was really not as it is today. So there was a difference. Mm. There was Very a difference. And in the, in the Bank of Ghana, even though the central bank governor is very, very important and very high up there, you are not in the public domain. The governor comes out only once to talk to the country, and that is all. The governor is in, if you like, a little city, and you do your own But his thing. signature is on our money. <laughs> yeah, but that's, 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 if you like, the most public aspect that you see. Everything else... It's so behind the doors that you do not see it. You only see the effects. So in a way, it's not quite the same. It's very interesting you say you prayed about this because I was talking to people close to you who said to me that when both of you were younger, he told you that one day he'll be governor of the Bank of Ghana. And it, it seems as if he had that vision prophetically or some, from some way. So it shouldn't have been a surprise for you that he became governor. Is it true that when you were very young, he said that one day he would be governor? Actually, it's very interesting because let me go a bit even back. When we were going to do the donation to Moray Senior Secondary School, um, I went there and realized that they had a workshop with no tools mm. and therefore decided to finish the woodwork workshop. Then I remembered that when he was in infant spring, he did so well in woodwork that he said to his parents he wanted to be a carpenter. And you can imagine in those days, they said, no, 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 you cannot be a carpenter. You, so for us, when we decided to do the woodwork workshop, we all laughed because <laughs> here he wanted to be a carpenter wow. and we go. Wow. And then in the university, when he was doing his national service, there were four of them doing the service together. And each of them were, was talking about what they wanted to be in future. And then he says, I'll be the governor of the central bank. And they all laughed. Wow. They all laughed. And he said, you know, I'll be a lecturer first and then governor of the central bank. And that's exactly what he, he was. So he didn't know he would become vice president. So it was beyond his own ambition. Because a lot of people are very ambitious. And in fact, yes. you have people who are... For the vice president, no, it isn't one of those things he said. But he said he would be a lecturer and then governor of the central bank. Wow. Yeah. But having accepted the role... How did you face it, being now publicly the second most important person in the country, a private family, Ghanaians complaining, economy is hard, doing difficult work, people don't appreciate because they say politicians are all the same, when you knew that you even struggled to want to even take the job. I'm sure it must have been tough for you. It wasn't really tough because I decided that I'll continue doing what I was doing. I worked in the University of Ghana Library, BAM Library. I worked in British Council. I worked in USIAD. And then I set up my own consultancy, doing training, and then managing charitable work. And so I decided that I'll continue with my training and managing my charitable organization. And that's exactly what I did. And therefore, I didn't have anybody prescribe anything to me. You know, interestingly, that position doesn't come with the terms of reference. That's the interesting part of it. Nobody tells you what to do. So you carve out what you want to do. And if we look back, first ladies, I don't like second lady, and wives of the vice presidents have done what they want to do, and nobody has said, do something different. And for me, I had something doing, so I just continued. And I didn't crave the limelight because already I've been doing these things, and I already had my niche. So I just continued. So you are into education, into reading, helping kids, setting up libraries. That's your area of specialty. Yeah, in 1996, I'd done some work for USAID as a consultant. And in one of their baseline studies, I realized that children couldn't read, even children in Accra. And so I set up an NGO called Reading for Life to help children to read. And we were involved in going to schools and communities helping children with skills to read, and then also helping teachers and um, the parents. And I brought in books to help build libraries and so on. And I'd been doing this till my husband became vice president, so I continued. But I say, interestingly, while I was doing this, my son, Kwesi, who's an ophthalmic surgeon, came back home one holiday and went with me on one of my projects. And he said to me, Mommy, have you considered that some of the children, it's not that they are daft, they are eyes. 
Wow. So we added a health part to it where he or some optical people will look at the eyes. Wow. And then we realized that some of them had problems in the eyes. So we added a medical aspect to it where we'll look at the eyes and then we'll give hospital supplies. So we went from just purely giving children skills to read to also looking at their health. Mm. Yeah. Do you think the role of the first lady and the second lady should be properly defined? There's a discussion going on around that. All of you do things on your own, with your own resources. Some people feel that because of the influence you have, the state must provide a specific sp a space for you to choose what you want to implement, but fund it. So yours is education, somebody's own is health. Instead of simply letting you use your own money and your own time to pursue the social cause or whatever cause you want to pursue. I think that um, going back, if you go back to Nkroma, you go back to Buzia, the first ladies and the wives of the vice presidents have not done anything in those roles. And therefore, there had never been the need. If my memory serves me right, it is only when Jerry John Rawlings became the head of state that the wife Nana Kudedu started doing things. And so in the history of Ghana, that was when the wife of the president started doing things. At that time, the wife of the vice president wasn't doing much. Then after that, they were not doing anything. So it's very difficult to say why hasn't roles been defined because nothing had been done. And I dare to say that I think it is me becoming what Ghanaians say, second lady, that it became obvious that things were being done. And simply because I was doing these things before and I carried on. So for a lot of people, they even thought that government was giving me money to do it. But government never gave me anything. Mm. I did it out of my own resources. But now, looking at what happened in my time and going forward, I think that it will be proper for the roles to be clearly defined for people to know exactly what they will do so that there are no overlaps, number one, and for good coordination to be had, and also for the two women to be funded to do a better job. Because for example, um, if it is not something you do already, when that position, when you leave that position, you might not continue. In my case, because it's something that I've been doing, I still continue, I'm doing it. But again, if you go back, Nana Kunedu, what not, what not, everything fizzled out. Wow. So if the roles are well defined, if resources are given, when you are in that position and after, then for continuity, things will flow out well. This is the point of view. We're having a chat with Mrs. Matilda Misata, Ghana's former second lady. This week is a very important anniversary. A very important program was launched as well, where the chair for economics at Ligon was inaugurated. The lectures have also been instituted. And um, we are talking about that ahead of a book launch, Strength in the Storm, When a Loved One Dies. And it's an interesting book we'll talk about, which laces personal stories with practical things. It's actually a practical guide, but it's written in a very personal way. We'll talk about the book. Before we, we take a, 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 a tour into the book, don't go away. Environmentally friendly, affordable, and quality fertilizers. Committed to improving crop production and ensuring food security through improved yields in Ghana. This is Glofet Limited, a wholly owned Ghanaian company with a global outlook. Ghana's leading name in fertilizer production, Glofet has built a state-of-the-art 120 metric tons per hour fertilizer blending factory, the largest in Ghana. This is able to blend all types of MPK to the specific requirements of farmers. With a 45,000 metric ton warehouse, trust Glofet Limited for all types of MPKs, urea, sulfate of ammonia, potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate, boron, and many more. Glofet is currently participating in the Planting for Food and Jobs initiative under the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Call us on 0544-339-513 or 0243-512-171. Locate our head office at number 2 Ni Amon Lake, East Legon, Accra. Email sales at glofet.com. Glofet, growing growth.
I feel you need to talk briefly about three things for me. Number one, so you work with three presidents. Your husband works with three presidents. One as deputy minister for, and then minister for the person. That's Rawlings. Then one as no, governor. No, not minister. As secretary. It was called secretary. Secretary to PNDC secretary. called deputy PNDC secretary. Good. And then deputy minister. minister. Under yeah. all Rawlings. Under Rawlings, yeah. Then governor under Mills. Yes. And then vice president under Mahama. Yes. So... For those of us who are not in politics, we hear a lot of things about Rawlings. How was it like working with him and, and, and running finance? Because it's Kwechibuchi times. Mm -hmm. So this, <laughs> those days when Kwechibuchi is reading the budget, we stop everything and listen mm -hmm. because we are told the price of Kinki will be determined <laughs> by the budget. How was it working within that period? Any special things he said to you within those difficult times in the 80s? Uh, those were interesting times because... For, for, for you may be younger, so you didn't know. Most of the ministers and deputy ministers and deputy secretaries were in their 30s. They just, Koito Bikwache was in his 20s. He just finished national service. Wow. And they had just finished school, worked maybe two or three years, and they were asked to serve government. So it was purely a sacrificial job they were doing. And commitment was very high, passion was very high. And they just worked and worked and worked. And it was more like a family working. And so there was nothing like jealousies, envies, um, all those negativities. Mm. Everybody worked and worked well. And the whole idea was to make Ghana good again. How was it like working for Rawlings? Rawlings was feared by people outside politics. Probably those in politics as well. And I'm sure there were times... The family had to meet because there were maybe annual dinners or whatever. What, what kind of person was he in those days? You know, everybody has their good and bad sides. Rollins those days set out to right a wrong, as he said. If you listen to his takeover speech, he said that Ghanaians had been deprived and corruption was high and therefore he wanted to straighten things. And so he put technocrats to do their work and did not interfere with them. And he went on to deal with, the, if you like, the bigger issues of corruption and so on. And therefore, did not interfere with whatever was happening in the finance ministry or any other ministry. So they did not actually have him breathing on their necks. They did not, which was a good thing. But was your husband a socialist or left-leaning person? Because in those days... The revolution was focused on people like that. They were all thinking about the world in a certain way. They were all left-leaning, who wanted poor people to be better, and they had a certain ideology and all those things. Was he always in that ideological framework, or how did he get to be part of the PNDC? Before the Rawlings takeover, there was a group in Legon called NDM, and that was a steady group. Gozitano, Chichiopoku, Kwame Kakari, Akila Pasoya, my husband, Kwisi Boche, and they had a steady group, and they studied socialism, and they also studied how to make the poor person not become rich, the poor person gets access to the piece of the cake. Okay. Yeah. And so this group had been going on for years. So it was part of the Chaliwate socialists, Chaliwate wearing... So they were not they, wearing Charlie Wati. That's how they are you know, reported. You know, interestingly, it was only Chachu Chikata in that group who was wearing lolly tie. You know, they used to make uh, slippers out of car ties. And he was the only one in that group who was wearing that. The rest were wearing shoes. But the typical Ghanaian Isn't branded them all. Charlie Wati wearing shoes. No, it was only Chachu Chikata who was wearing that. The rest was we were but, wearing But you things. were born on June 4th. We, are, we know. So long, it, long, long before the revolution. Yes, but then there has to be a relationship. So it means every June 4 anniversary was your birthday. Yes. That was quite interesting. But long before the revolution, I was born. <laughs> you were in your 20s when the revolution happened. Yes. So you understood it. Yes. And so you, how, how were you celebrating your birthdays in those days? You mean after the revolution? No, I mean, so every June 4, you know, because June 4 was a big holiday in Ghana. Yeah, before, before the revolution... My birthday, I was celebrating my birthday. After the revolution, I still celebrated. Did you not anyway. feel that there was this connection between your birth date and June 4? No. Because June 4 was seen as a holy day. No, no, no. I didn't see any connection. At it's just all. a coincidence. So you are not a revolutionary? No, it's just a, co a coincidence. People just say you're a revolutionary. They say you speak your mind. 
People say you are you are very forthright and you don't suffer fools gladly. So you are quite the revolutionary. You know, I, I, I hate hypocrisy and I hate dishonesty. Whether it's my party or not, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, it's right. I look at the larger picture. And for me, there's good in everybody. And so we must help to bring out the good in people and not put people down. And I come from a, a place where I'm looking out to ensure that people get the best. I'm looking out to ensure that nobody suffers. And I'm looking out to see people work and work hard. And therefore, why would I say it's red when it's green? Hey, then some people say yeah, you can't be a politician. Yes. Because the, the typical things they do sometimes suggest that they have to speak for their side. And they have to make sure they do better. So sometimes they can't be forthright. Sometimes they can't be honest. But if you remember, on different platforms, I've said that I'm not a politician. And I've been taken to tax. One of the papers actually put me there saying, how can she say she's not a politician? But I'm right and I say it even now today. I'm not a politician. I've never been a politician. You'll never be even one. Even my husband was a technocrat who became the vice president and therefore became a politician. You understand where I'm coming from? Yes. And he still worked in the capacity of a technocrat. I am not a politician. I found myself mounting the platform in support of my husband and my party. And if you look at every platform I mounted, I never promised anything. Because I used to tell them those days that first of all, I have not been elected, so I cannot promise. And about those days, somebody come and tap me and say, Madam, don't say you haven't been elected, you cannot promise. Madam, don't say that. And I'll say to them, I haven't been elected. And you see, even for the position of vice president, you are not voted for. The president is the only one who is voted for. You are his running mate. The only person who has been elected is the president. All of us have not been elected. So why should I go and promise? And in my case, I'm supporting my husband, supporting my party. I don't have an office. I don't have a budget yet. So can you imagine me promising? Where do I get the money to go and do it? I believe in being honest, being truthful. So, and of course, I speak my mind. So how do you whip up the, when you go to a, a constituency and the people are waiting for you to charge, to say something for them to go and vote? And then you say, well, I'm not a politician. That would be an anticlimax. The position requires you to do politics, doesn't it? Hey, but they love me. You know, they love me to bits on the campaign trail. They love me to bits. Because, you see, we have the view that people want to hear lies. It's not true. Okay. People can decipher lies and truthfulness. And behind it all, they know who is speaking the truth. Mm. And even though they may shout or not shout or everything, I don't know, they, they respect you for being who you are. And I can tell you that I was a favorite on the campaign trail. Really? I was a favorite because I could ginger the crowds. Okay. I could ginger the crowds by just being down to earth, coming to their level, telling them the real truths. So did you travel around the country during campaigns? How many places did you go? Because the, the shadows were quite hectic. Everywhere. You know, what was in my, to my advantage is that in the work that I do with my charity, I've gone to every constituency in the country. You've gone to every constituency in the In the country. work that I do, I've gone to every constituency in the country before my husband became vice president. And consulting for ministry of education in the year 1999 to 2002, I went to every constituency in Ghana, wow. putting books. I worked on a um, British government project where we put books in schools. And I went to every constituency. So oh. every constituency in Ghana, by the time my husband became vice president, they knew me. So our month platform and some teacher, somebody will say that she, she is. So wow. I said, that was my advantage. Wow. They knew me already. So it was very easy. So you brought knowledge of the terrain to the Yeah, politics. so it was very easy. Amazing. Yeah. So on election nights, do you pray, hoping for victory? 2012 election, were you fasting? Were you blowing tongues? We pray every day. <laughs> the thing is, we pray every day. We pray every time. It's been a part of us. Uh, we've done it for years and we are still doing. So, so as the results come, what do you do? Do you stay in the house with him? Because I'm sure they are monitoring somewhere. Yes, we, 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 we group together, we monitor. And, you know, um, our take was and still is that God has the power to do whatever. And God does the best for his children. And therefore, whether it is what you want, whether you, it is what you wish for or not, as a child of God, you accept it and you move on. 
Wow. Therefore, elections come and you win. You praise the Lord, thank him, and you move on. Election results are declared and you lose. You praise the Lord, you thank him, and you move on. You do not praise God only when it's good. I see. What about Mills? Working with Mills. He, again, from outside, in fact, a lot of people felt one of the reasons why your husband was chosen was that many people thought that this is the one Mills would have wanted, or this is the man Mills would have recommended, or this is the man Mills trusted. That came up a lot in the, in the media about, because don't forget, it was a sudden death for Mills, and the party didn't have a lot of time to make a choice. So ex explain the relationship with Mills, because it was such an overwhelming endorsement to choose somebody who was that quiet and who was not that political, who was such a technocrat, to be running mate for a, a new ticket less than six months to an election. So what was the relationship with Mills like? And was your husband the man Mills would have chosen? Pastor Mills was a friend. We both worked in Legon. So he was not just a colleague of my husband, but a personal friend also. And for those who do not know, when Pastor Mills was head of revenue, IRS. my husband was the deputy minister of finance, and he had direct supervision of the revenue secretariat. So they worked very closely together. So that was it. Now, as to whether Professor Mills would have chosen him, I cannot tell. I cannot tell. <laughs> what I know is that when the former president, John Mahama, sent that my husband be told to be the running mate, one of the questions my husband asked was, why the choice? And the answer came that because of his integrity. That's why he wanted him. His integrity, yeah. which is very similar to Mills Rawlings as well. Yeah, that's because he was also seen as a technocrat who was honest, who was also a fanti. Yeah, so that's, that's the reason um, the um, President your mama gave. Very interesting. Yeah. So when your husband was deputy finance minister, Mills was head of IRS. So yes. that means at that time your husband was his boss. Yes, yes, because uh, he had direct oversight. Over of, the revenue. Yes. So they, that's yes. where they, they bond. And they were both yes. in Legon as well. Yes. I see. Mm. Interesting. So are you still close to the Mills family? Yes. Very. Mm. I see. And then, of, then the last one before we move to the book, your husband's relationship with Mahama. Because this is vice president relationship now, mm. and this is political in a politicized Ghana. How was it? I did not bother myself too much about what went on in the politics. I minded my business in helping children to read and making sure that the private hospitals had equipment and given disadvantaged women's skills. Mm. So I didn't know much about what went on in Flat Staff House or Jubilee House. But what I know is that they worked well as a president and vice president. They worked well? Yeah, that's what I know. I see. Because there are some who say that there were lots of interesting developments within those times. Because don't forget the Mahama government had some very many challenges. They had doom sort to deal with. Mm -hmm. They had the quite a number of problems, which eventually led to the loss in 2016. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the NDC people felt that the kind of challenges they had, Ghanaians were not even fair to them because of the difficult time. But how was it dealing with the Doomsaw crisis, dealing with the CD depreciation? Because he left the Bank of Ghana to become the, the, the vice president. All of a sudden, the CD, which is directly under the Bank of Ghana, starts misbehaving. 2013, 2014, lots of challenges. I've never gone into governance but from where i sit i know that governance is not easy we all talk we all bash people in government we are all critics and we are all experts as it were but i know that it is not easy and i know that if we are put there we'll have the same challenges so definitely yes there were a lot of challenges but i also know that they did their best and i can talk for my husband that he did his best in solving all the problems that were given to him. Like I said to you in the start, a vice president just does what the president would ask him to do. You never do what you have not been asked to do. But he's the head of the economic management team. So that, and don't forget, he's an, he's an economist, former deputy minister, former governor of the Bank of Ghana, now vice president. So when the economy is having problems, he's the man everybody's looking at because he has the EMT. So the, the economic state which a lot of people think is the most important thing you look out for in a government is directly under him. So even though he's a vice president, he's actually the guy who's coordinating the economic policy. You see, what is interesting, and I'm sure this government will tell you, 
We all think that the economic management team is some team that is set there and all they do is manage the economy. That's what we all think. It is wrong. What and is this government will tell you. There's nothing like that team set there and that is all they do. A group of people have been brought together from time to time. They meet on things. That's simply how it is. It's a loose So thing. it's not a functioning, it is not a working fun group, It is it. not. Oh, okay. It is not. But so unfortunately, we all think that it is a group that is there and functioning as such, and that's all that they do. No. Plus, even when these, this group meets and they decide everything, it has to go to the president. It has to go to cabinet before. So again, when this group meets, it doesn't mean that whatever they decided, it, what is done. It goes to the president, they report to the president, who then takes it to cabinet. Cabinet agrees before. And they say, all these things, we do not know sitting outside. Mm. Yeah. Some people think that because of his choice as vice president, now everybody wants an economist or a technocrat to partner a ticket. So it's almost like one of his possibly unintended legacies. Mm -hmm. Is that something you as, as accept? Uh, because the role of the vice president is not clearly defined and you don't even have a terms of reference, what it says is in the absence of the president. Everything says in the absence of the president or as the president gives to you. That's all that it says. So that I, as a, an ordinary person, do not think that it has to be an economist. Mm -hmm. I do not think so. I think it just has to be a capable person, that's mm. all, capable in all spheres. But I think that in Ghana, because we have so many challenges with our economy, that is why we prefer an economist. I may be wrong, but that's what I think. This is the point of view. When we come back, we'll find out more about what is in this book. Very interesting. Some people have called to say to her, we know you will tell us what happened. In fact, you said somebody even said they know you will release on Apo in the book. So we'll talk about the point in the book when we come back. This is the point of view. Stay with us. Every weekday at 8 p.m., City Newsroom brings you analysis of the major news stories of the day. In-depth, comprehensive, and researched. It's one hour of local and international news from 8 to 9 p.m. It's the City Newsroom, weekdays on City TV. Welcome back. This is The Point of View. My guest is Mrs. Matilda Misatha, who is the former second lady. She's an author. She's a, um, an educationist. And we're, we're talking about a book that she's launching this July, Strength in the Storm, When a Loved One Dies. And this book is almost a year, just one year since, since it happened. That's quite fast to, to process grief to, re to put yourself together and write a book which is about 150 pages, which was quite, I couldn't put it down, I, I read it in, at one go. That's quite remarkable. What's driving this? When my husband died, I realized that we do not talk about death in this country. And I also realized that the bereaved is on their own. Hmm. Nobody offers you any assistance in terms of emotional People are concerned about what you are eating, how you are sleeping, but nobody is thinking about how you are going through your pain, mm. how you are processing your grief. Nobody is thinking about that. Plus, they are all pushing you to the edge, if you like, because don't do this, you cannot do this, you cannot go here, you cannot wear this and so on. So they are pushing you to the edge. And I try to look for books to read to help me at a time. And I looked out and could not find anything. A few friends brought me things written by Americans and Europeans. They were not quite what I wanted. Most of them were inspirational books. You know, they like yes. some Bible verses and some explanation. There were only two who talked about the um, 11th um, September, 9-11 um, twi Twitter. And they were written 
in a different perspective, not quite what I wanted. So I started looking in Ghana and I didn't find anything. And so I began to think of the fact that there are many people in my situation who were groping in the dark. And even then, I hadn't made up my mind to write. But in the sixth month after my husband died, I went to the cemetery. And that's one of the things I was doing quite often, going to the cemetery to sit down and cry and pray and sing. And then while I was at the cemetery, I felt God speaking to me and saying to me that, why are you allowing the death of your husband to take away everything? Mm. And it's like, the picture I saw was like throwing everything into a fire and burning it all. And when I came back home, I started thinking, at the same time, a prayer partner, who is a German, had been telling me, oh, you know, Tilly, you would write a book, write a book. And I was getting so upset with her. I write a book for what? And she kept saying, oh, you write a book. And I was getting so upset. But then I found myself jotting things, jotting things. And nine months after my husband died, I found out that I jotted a whole lot of things. Wow. And that is how I began to write a book. So partly because of the need, there was no book like this. Yes. So you are trying to fill a void. And also because there was an urge to put stuff together. But did you know what kind of book you were going to write when you started? Uh, when I started, I knew I wanted to write something that would help people who had lost. Mm -hmm. I don't like the word lost. People whose spouses had died. Good. People who were grieving. People who were going through the storm as it were. Mm. So I knew I was going to write something. But I also knew that I didn't have to write the thing in a void, in a vacuum. I knew that I had wow. to use my experience wow. for it to be meaningful. I'm laughing because I'm smiling because there's a lot of filler in the book, <laughs> which we didn't have. So how were you able to, because some of the chapters, for example, were about traditional rights. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of analysis of some of the things we do and the effect on spouses. Mm -hmm. And you're able to list your experience. In fact, the other thing I found interesting was people trying to comfort you who are actually aggravating the situation. Mm -hmm. That, that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. How were you able to decide what to put inside? Because, you, in fact, one of the chapters says, who killed who? Mm -hmm. Chapter 5. <laughs> who killed who? That's a serious chapter. That chapter, the title of that chapter came up as a result of, you know, interestingly, two weeks after the... Actually, before my husband was buried, I think the week that he was, my husband was buried four weeks after he died. Yes. The week he was going to bury it, I got a call. And the man said to me, you have to come and talk to a lady whose husband has died. And I snapped. And I went, how could you do this to me? I haven't buried my husband. How can I go and talk to somebody? He said to me, everybody says, you should come and talk to the woman. Four and weeks after. Four weeks after. Then I burst out crying. I cried the whole day. I thought the man was so Carlos. uncaring. And how could he do that? So after my husband was buried, he called again and said, can you come and talk to the woman? I knew this woman who has husband died, and I knew the husband. Then I made a mistake, inverted comments, because it wasn't a mistake. So I told this German prayer partner of mine, Silke, I said to Silke, when we pray, Silke, can we pray about this? And that I just want this people not to bag me to go and talk. So my prayer was, God should just not let this people bag me to go and talk to the woman. Okay. And Silke said, Auntie Tilly, you have to go and talk to her. Wow. You have to go and talk to her. So I went to talk to this woman. And then I realized all kinds of things. Wow. And so that informed me on that. And subsequently, I began talking to people. And my children asked me once, have you made an advert in every place? Because people were calling me, talk to this person who has lost a spark, talk to this person. And I'm like, my husband just died. Why? And I'll go and talk to them. So from the few people that I spoke to, that's how that chapter came. Because I realized that in Ghana, no husband dies without the wife being blamed. Oh. Thank God, I think I'm the only woman who hasn't been said killed the husband when the husband died. But in Ghana, every man who dies, the wife killed them. So that's how the chapter came about. Who killed who? <laughs> So clearly, the experience you went through was something God was using to strengthen you to help other people. So even though you were resisting it, it's very clear you have the gift because you wrote about how after speaking to that woman, she embraced you and everything changed. It's almost like you have a ministry that you were resisting. 
this lady, Soke, my prayer partner, said to me two weeks after my husband died that God is going to give you a new ministry. By that time, with the pain and the anguish and everything, I don't even think I hate her. I don't even think I hate her. I had my own pain to go through that I didn't mind her. But yes, you are right. Through my pain, through my suffering, God actually gave me a new ministry. And even um, before it was two months after my husband died, I was already traveling with widows and widowers. I was going to meet widows and widowers, talking to them and so on. So it's a completely new ministry, as I point out in the book. So this is obviously a book for different groups of people who have to deal with grieving and, and things like that. What is your key message to those who want to get it? What will it do for them? If I buy this, what will it do for me? A number of things. One, this book is for people who have lost loved ones mm. and who do not have any help and who may want some answers to some questions. Mm -hmm. And I say that it's not a blueprint because I do not claim that I have all the answers. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I want to do is to offer encouragement, to offer some solace to somebody who is grieving. The second thing I want this book to do is to let people realize that when you are at your lowest, you do not have to remain there. You can get up and you can move on. The third thing, which for me is the most important, is to let people realize that your faith, in God works wonders when you are at your lowest and wow. therefore God is everything you spoke about the grieving process is it a Ghana thing or an African thing it was very clear that you were not allowed to grieve properly because some people say things which are even going to make things worse is it that we, do, we are not trained because you are saying that some of the things people say like he's in a better place God is need, God has a need for the person um, I mean <laughs> It is well. And you were a Christian, but you, you thought that some of those things rather worsen the situation. So for people who <laughs> who want to help, in fact, let me go through that chapter. You are talking things like don't cry. Your spouse is in a better place. Don't worry. You will be fine. If there's anything I can do, don't hesitate to call me. You sort of dealt with all these things and said <laughs> these things all are almost like non far. <laughs> there, there are two things. When a loved one dies, Mm. you mourn and you grieve there are mm. two different things you mourn and you grieve the mourning is the crying and the wailing and all that the, the mourning comes to an end there can be a time that you say even though it hurts I'm shattered but you realize that you are not mourning as if you are not crying you are not wailing but you do not stop grieving in fact, I don't know when you stop grieving because it's just a year since my husband died and I haven't stopped grieving. Mm. Grieving is an inward thing that doesn't always come out. You can be smiling, going about your duties, but you'll be grieving. Grieving is a silent hurt. That is not let out always. Wow. People do not let you mourn and do not let you grieve and leave you alone because, you know, it is not as if they want to hurt you. But I think by our culture, we do not know the exact things to say. And therefore, even though people mean well, the words do not come out as they mean. For example, when somebody says, don't cry, mm. um, your husband is a better place. What they mean is, I know you are in pain, mm -hmm. but just to assure you that everything will be okay. I'm sure that's exactly what they mean. But when it comes out, don't cry. Your husband is in a better place. At that point that my husband has died, all I want is answers to why he died. And if anything, I want my husband back. So for you to come and tell me he's in a better place, as if I don't know. And Christians are fond of saying he's in a better place, he's going to heaven. You don't tell somebody the obvious. They we all read it. our Bible. We know that if you are a believer, you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. When you die, you go to heaven. You don't come and say the obvious to the person. You know, the best thing to do, go and sit with the person. If you can pray, pray with the person. If you cannot pray, keep quiet. But be there. But be there for them. So that when they need them, you are there. So, so it's not even talking. It's more like the Bible said, Job's, um, Job's friends. friends came to sit with you him know, for you know seven what days. Yes. They just sat down. They just sat there. Yeah. It's better yeah. that way. It's better that way. If you can say something better, 
but mind what you how you say you see uh, emotions are raw at that time emotions are very raw and even though you mean well the way sometimes it comes out for example somebody said to my husband you want to know about oh sent to who my my daughter you want to know about oh. then somebody said to me oh you, you are lucky when my husband died i was only 40 something <laughs> of course when your husband you were 40 something oh, when was that? I was 60 something i can't compare with yours but a death it's a death and at that time that the person is going through the pain words can cut like a knife wow we didn't know all this happened uh, you, you 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 address something controversial because during the the day of the funeral mm -hmm. on the 28th of july mm -hmm. You went off script, mm -hmm. and I saw Chrissy trying to control you because, and I know my mom, we know her mothers. He was really trying to tell you to calm down, but you sort of went off script and just freed your mind. <laughs> Why did you do that? You know, if you, if you, if you had the funeral brochure, you realize that I didn't read the funeral brochure. I just did a one-page summary of the tribute that I was going to read. If you ask me, I was reading it. But somewhere along the line, I think I was led by the Holy Spirit, and I just said what I said. And you see, I addressed that in the book because some people, media was divided. Some said I did the right thing. Some said I did the wrong thing. Some even called me names and said, but your husband knew politics, death will be thrown at him, so you shouldn't have said that. And if you listen carefully with what I said, I didn't mention names. I was not like Malema who mentioned names. I never mentioned anybody's name. All I said was talking about the hypocrisy, the dishonesty, and so on. The lies. So going back to the things I said at the beginning of this interview, I hate hypocrisy, I hate dishonesty, I hate lies. I hate those things. And I think that when my husband died, it came to the fore how dishonest, how hypocritical we can be as a people. Because a lot of people who threw insults at my, at my husband, who said he was good for nothing, and that he didn't do any work and so on, actually came and said, he was not just a gentleman, gentleman, but he was so hardworking, he worked so well, he was fantastic, and so on. You couldn't take it. Whichever way you look at it, it's hypocrisy. And you see, one of the things I said there was to the effect that those who know his worth value him. You see, if you don't know somebody's worth, don't talk. Keep quiet. Mm. Internationally, in Ghana, people know my husband's worth. And you see, this one year has proved to everybody. Look at the numbers of people this one year who have come and said about the work he did and so on and so forth. So those people, aren't they hypocrites? They are hypocrites. You see, me, I call a spade a spade, though. You free me, your mind. I will not lie. I will not lie. You see, there's no point in lying. And as I say in, in my book, because of our hypocrisy, because of our dishonesty. Let's end with two, two quick points. This book is supposed to explore your journey back to happiness. What, what makes you happy these days? What, what do you find doing that? Because obviously you've, you've evolved over the past one year. You are looking better than you were the day... We, the funeral was live on TV. I mm -hmm. saw you sitting. Mm -hmm. You could barely raise your hands to even shake people's hands. You were, you were absolutely forlorn. It was very clear that you were not acting. That this is somebody you loved who had died. And the fact that you were there when it happened was another issue as mm -hmm. well. How have you gone through that process to get the strength? What makes you happy these days? What, what, where do you get the drive from? In three days after my husband died, I lost 10 kilos. I lost 10 kilos in three days. Wow. That's how bad it was. Wow. You see, one of the things I say in the book is, it also depends on how close you were. I mean, I do not boast and say that we're the perfect couple, but I know that we loved each other, and I know that we we're close, and I would not deny that. Me, I call it spade a spade. We were close. And my children and those who know us called us conjoined twins. Wow. And that can tell you how shattered I was. But my faith in God and people I had around me, Christian friends I had around me, helped me. 
and at the point when I was very low, I realized that I had to pull myself. One of the things I realized was that no matter how many friends came around or whatever, if I didn't pull myself, nobody could pull me. And I could only pull myself by throwing myself back into the arms of God and relying on him to pull me. You see, it's like a bank account. When you put your money into a bank or make an investment, anytime you are broke, you go for it. It's the same with the word of God and believing in God and knowing the scriptures. When you are, you are in trouble, the scriptures come to you. And that is what you feed on. That's what carries you. So it is my faith in God and my friends who brought the word of God to me that moved me. Plus my own determination to get up and move on. Plus my children, you know, interestingly, they were all going through the loss. They were all grieving. They were all mourning. But they decided that they had to help me pull through. And so they did that. So really, for me, first and foremost, it is my faith in God. It is the word of God. And it is the grace of God that pulled me through. So when you see your, your children now, how proud are you of them? The way the Araba, we are told, edited the whole... 130 something pages mm -hmm. and then this event as well Kwesi and Araba doing obviously lawyer doctor and because again raising kids being a public figure is not easy because the job takes you away yet you've managed to raise a family your kids are on the straight and narrow you are a grandparent now and you don't sit around hoping that your, your child is not involved in some crazy thing. You are sure you've given them the right training. How are you able to pull that off in, 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 a, in a situation where for the, over 30-something years you are working for the public? And that's a very difficult work. How did you do it? So, for example, when I was working in British Council, I had oversight for the whole of Ghana. And I was traveling like every two weeks to Tamale and Kumase. And I made my travels in such a way that I'd go Friday after school. So I picked them up at the University of Ghana Primary School with their weekend clothes in my car and we go to Kumase or Tamale. And we stay there for the weekend. They are doing their homework, they are working, I'm so I say, while I'm working. And we come back Sunday evening, they go back to school. Wow. When it's midterm, then we have a longer period, we do the same. When there are holidays, I'm going to Nigeria, um, Sierra Leone, Liberia to work, I take them. And I supervise them because I couldn't leave them with a the house girl. It was difficult, but this is how we managed it. Thank you for talking to us. What is your, your final message to Ghanaians? My final message to Ghanaians is that we need to be there for each other, especially when people have hit rock bottom. Because in Ghana, whether it's a death or it's a loss of a job or something, you become a leper. You become a leper and everybody leaves you. And, but those are the times that you need people. Those are the times that you need not just people, but comforting words and so on. So I just want to entreat people that we must be there for each other. We must also learn to be truthful and honest. Ghana is a beautiful country. Everybody has some good. We must learn to pull each other up, especially when you lose a loved one. Let me say something. This book, this was not a title. Okay. My original title was, My Husband Died. <laughs> hey. The original title was, My Husband Died. And my publisher said, no. So you made that chapter one. <laughs> and I said, my husband died because we do not talk about death. Mm. And I want to break the ice for us wow. to talk about death because Solomon says, when you are alive, think about your mm. demise in Ecclesiastes. And we say, we will not. So I want my... Publisher said, Madam, no, you know what? It's too much in the face. Too, it's too, too powerful. But, but you see, you see the, what I'm driving at? Yes. So we came up to this. Strength in the storm. Yeah, but death is a storm. Wow. So I will entreat everybody to buy it. It is not the answer to everything, but I hope that it will answer some questions. Mrs. Mathilda and Mr. Arthur, thank you for talking to us. And a year after this incident, we are quite surprised by the strength you are showing. And the presence of mind to write such a great book. I've read it and I endorse it. And I think you should get a copy as well. And I hope you allow us into your house another time to talk about other things. Thank you.
Thank you. There are many more books coming. Amen. That's all we have time for for today's edition of The Point of View. We hope you've enjoyed it. And if you're watching this before Wednesday, the 3rd of July, make sure you are there to get a copy of the book. My name is Bernard Avila. Stay with CTTV.